Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Conversations with Annie and Kate. And tonight our guest is Anna Spargo Ryan, who is a Melbourne based author. She's uh, authored The Gulf and The Paper House. She's won the Horn Prize. She has had her short fiction published in a number of different properties. And she's also worked in digital marketing for 15 years, including time on Ramsey Street cool. and Formula One pits. That sounds like a very colourful past. And <laughs> she was the scriptwriter for Adweek's Global Marketing Podcast of the Year. So you've got really diverse experience. So welcome, Anna. Oh, thank you for having me. And hello, Annie. Hi, folks. Uh, it's good to be with everyone. Uh, what are you drinking, Kate? I have gin and tonic because I'm at home and I now have the NBN, so I don't have to leave the house to do this. I'm still <laughs> thoroughly impressed that we've, we've continued to improve from a couple of weeks ago where you ended up buying a gin and tonic in a can. <laughs> Who hasn't? That, that's, I mean, we've all been there, but still. Um, I have a, a nice 2018 Shiraz from the Clare Valley. Mm. What a lovely part of the world. I have an empty glass that did have water in it and now seems to have a part of a Kit Kat in the bottom. I'm okay. Not... Yeah, so that might go in the dishwasher. <laughs> Although, first question, was there actually a Kit Kat consumed in your day? <laughs> that is a mystery that may <laughs> never be answered. Love it. Very random. All right, mm. do you want to... The other thing that I did leave off, off the bio is, is that you live with, in Melbourne with your kids and your cats. Mm, two, and dogs. Cats yep, I've got dogs. two dogs, two cats, two children. <laughs> yep. Seems to be a pattern so, there. Yeah, the better pattern would be six cats, two dogs, two children, and then several more cats on top of that. But I have to make do with two for now. Sounds like yeah. fun. Yeah. Got to have something to aspire to. Any yeah. of you want to ask one of your questions first? Yes. Well, given that we have an author on the, uh, on the podcast for the first time, um, we're going to ask, so we've got this set list of questions and you're going to be the first person that I think either of us have asked this question to, mm. um, which is what are your, your favourite books that you recommend to people and why? Mm. I'm very less well-read than, than you might imagine or maybe you don't imagine but I, people often think that I have read more books than I have so I haven't read any classics really and I read about 10 books a year if I'm lucky um, but my favorite books are Olive Kitteridge by Elizabeth Strout I think Elizabeth Strout has an incredible knack for observing human behaviour and nature um, and the way that people interact with each other. And she's written this character. There's two books now. There's a sequel as well. Um, this character who is really unlikable but quite readable and a little bit sympathetic but not really. It's quite a feat of literature really uh, that she is compelling to read even though you kind of despise her. So, yeah, that's one of my very favourite books. Um, let me think. I read my favourite book this year uh, was The Animals in That Country, which is by Laura Jean McKay, who's an Australian writer who lives in New Zealand. Um, and that is about, it's actually about a wildly infectious flu, um, which made it an interesting book to read this year. But um, it has this language of animals in it, which is just astounding the way that uh, Laura has been able to interpret the meaning of um, of animals and how they perceive the world is really remarkable so both of those are excellent reads yeah and she did she write the book like many years ago or recently I'm just wondering where the whole you know sort of a wildly infectious <laughs> flu theme definitely a coincidence I mean also to her credit not or not to discredit the amount of research that she must have done into pandemics and what might happen if we had one, um, but well before COVID. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I think the timing of it, it came out while we were in lockdown. 
So, or the first time. So right. it's uh, quite a strange coincidence. And, and how is second lockdown going for you? <sighs> it's, it's odd, but it is less odd than it was at the start. Um, it has become quite normal to see people wearing masks mm -hmm. and running in the other direction and uh, not the shops not being open became normal fairly quickly. Um, it's made life in a way for me, someone who, you know, doesn't, doesn't have to really go anywhere at all. Uh, it's simple in some ways, although the homeschooling, the, the remote learning is just atrocious, but otherwise very simple. Yeah. It's, it's odd. It's, it feels old fashioned in some ways hmm. because, you know, once it's dark, you're at home and you don't leave again until the next day. Um, largely make all your own food. Don't go out to eat. Don't buy things you don't need because the shops aren't open to kind of browse around and, um, in that way yeah quite a basic kind of way to approach life I think so yeah it's, anyway becoming quite philosophical about it as it goes on and in some ways I think I'll sort of miss it a little bit at the end I it, it totally don't I, miss tricks you the commuting I don't miss mm. well I work from home anyway all the time so in that sense it hasn't changed for me very much but there's a I don't know, there's a sense of camaraderie that will go after it's over, I guess, which is... I think your, your other point around the simplicity of it and, and just reminding you, what do you actually really need mm. in life to actually be and to, to be able to, to function with your family, your friends, your kids, your, mm. your, your animals? You know, I, I only have <laughs> one dog. I don't have as many as you, but just actually all I need is a bit of food, dog biscuits and a bit of chicken for the dog, <laughs> wine in my wine rack and a walk around, a lap around the park a few times a day. That, that literally is mm. all. Yeah, I only need the things I already have and then the hundreds of dollars of skincare products that I keep buying <laughs> and food for my animals. Yeah. Well, it's very simple. <laughs> everybody need, has their needs. You know? That's right. That's right. I've got a, this is my new lockdown hobby. My sister and I both, we keep sending them to each other, which means it's like a gift instead of an indulgence. Well, that's different. Yeah, it is. It's, it's completely different. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a very good dynamic to have developed. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it is. And, and a bit, you know, it's, it's really fascinating because focusing on all the things you used to do, like, you know, you used to get up and put work clothes on. You used to put on makeup. You used to do all of this stuff. And I know so many women who've just discovered they don't need to do that anymore. It's oh, yeah. I mean, I, I stopped doing that years ago. But, yes, I, I many, many women I know who just <laughs> realise how much extra time they have when they don't do those things oh. <laughs> and how much more comfortable. What's exactly. a bra? What's that for? Nothing. You don't need heels. it. Heels. High heels. Yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> pantyhose no thank you stretchy waistbands exactly yeah yeah but the, the, that that's that's a really interesting thing that that so many women hadn't abandoned those things already and have now realized from being in lockdown they can abandon them and like I've, I've got people who you know always used to turn up at work in a suit that like our privacy officer, who, who's now com completely comfortable having meetings, de Zoom and Teams meetings, in his hoodie. And I'm like, I wonder what he's going to do when he goes back to the office. Is he going to go back into the suit or is he going to continue with this? It'll be really interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, it's nothing like this, but I'm going to say it now anyway. When I was in year nine, went on school camp with my science teacher, who was our camp leader. And while we were on camp, he swore all the time. And then we got back to class. And we were in year nine science and we started swearing to him. And he was like, no, not anymore. That was only for camp. So I wonder whether there are elements of this that are, you know, only for lockdown. And now that you're back in the office, it's, yeah, you have to wait until the next lockdown. I, I'm going to try, I'm going to have another try with a question that I've asked before with, it wasn't very successful last time, but I'm going to try again. What is your favourite popular culture thing and why? Mm. 
it's a good question. I like a lot of pop culture things. My last person just said I don't like pop culture and it was like Really? <laughs> oh no, I'm trying to narrow it down. I um I mean I have teenagers who love anime and all of the different they have dozens of different fandoms that they're part of which have seeped into my life just from being in the house all the time. Um pop culture is I mean the language of internet memes is one of my favourite things about pop culture. Tweets that you can't understand unless you've been on Twitter all day of that day and they're kind of, you know, at the end of the day, there are three or four different <laughs> memes mashed together that are only from that day and if you miss them, then the, the last tweet just won't make any sense at all. That's one of my favourite things about pop culture. I really like the Bachelor franchise, which is... <sighs> You know, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, what, it's what, one of, do you, what do you like about that? I can't get into it. I like, I like, actually, I like the communal element of watching it. So I get involved in the live tweeting of it, which I think is just a really nice thing to do. Uh, that it's better, live tweeting shows is better when they show tweets on the screen. That was something that we were into a few years ago. But it's still nice to, especially at the moment, actually, it's still nice to feel like, you're part of a conversation with a wider group of people than just the other people in your lounge room. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I like to believe in love, I guess. So it's becoming harder to like it because as the years go on, there's less and less love and much more Instagram um, influences. So maybe I don't like it as much as I used to. Um, and I really like, like gentle reality TV shows. So there's been a few on Netflix lately that have been excellent. So there's one called The Big Flower Fight, which was teams of two. So about six or six or eight teams of two who had themes each week of uh, gigantic flower sculptures that they had to make. So it was like, you know, we're going to make a, a gigantic lion made out of different kinds of flowers and they had different criteria each week for how you had to make them and what you had to put in them and you know you have to include things that are alive or you have to include succulents or they have to be potted or they loved that uh there was another one called crazy delicious which was a heston blumenthal reality show set in like a magic forest <laughs> they had to forage forage for food that had been planted in the fake enchanted uh -huh. forest and then make strange things out of them that was wonderful um so any anything like that i love yeah. that sort of stuff that's properly up my street so i just watched <laughs> on netflix um a uh, wilderness cabins oh yeah it was brilliant so it was set in wales and it was a competition of different for, uh, go watch it's only four episodes it won't take you long to burn through it but there's just something delightful about people making things from scratch and then you judging them, even though you have absolutely no <laughs> right. or You experience. could never do it. Yeah, I could, I could never build a cabin, but I'm going to judge the shit out of the <laughs> seeing right. on this show. And exactly. Oh, each there was one week where I agreed with the winner, and then the other <laughs> three weeks I completely disagreed and was like shouting at the TV. I'm like, this is meant to be joyful TV. Why am I getting so vested? <laughs> Yeah, there's that as well. You just start to have a lot of opinions when you watch some of these shows. But they're very, they avoid the trope of having, mm -hmm. you know, disaster reality TV, people crying and sob stories and and drama between contestants and all the things that make, actually make The Bachelor really <laughs> good watching. But it does become exhausting. So these shows that are just nice, yeah, there's a difference between car crash TV and then just gentle TV, like you just said. Mm. Um, yeah. Have you watched, so I'm, I'm going to guess you've seen some of the Bake Off programs. I have before. seen all all of them, yeah. You've seen the yeah. Canadian one. Yes. <laughs> God, it's yes. so good. But it's really good because I as you would expect, the Canadians are so lovely all the way through and they're so, you know, sort of pleasant to each other and polite. And mm. not to say that the British Bake Off, the New Zealand Bake Off and the Aussie ones aren't, but just it, it's like an extra level of niceness. It is niceness. I know. And it's very, I think all of them really, but especially that Canadian one, have 
copied the vibe of the British one really closely. Mm. I was really pleasantly surprised to see that that Canadian one just aligned so well. You almost could, you know, they're almost interchangeable. It's kind of mm. gentle, lovely kindness um, that, yeah, it, it's still after so many seasons of the Great British Bake Off and all of its spin-offs works so well. Like, I just love being in this space, being ar around these people, you know, mm. that I don't have to be <laughs> worried about, you know, something might go horribly wrong or someone might attack me through the screen or it's just nice. Mm. And occasionally someone accidentally steals someone else's, like, ice cream and <laughs> that's it. That's That's the extent of the drama, which I, you know, the world is what it is and so sometimes just need that stuff really do we do i agree yeah mm. do, you, do you think that 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 kind of approach to life where you don't want the drama how does that play into to your writing because your writing's a bit different to that maybe it's just a, a break from the writing maybe the writing is so much different from that <laughs> after the writing i need to go and because I watch a lot of YouTube cooking shows as well uh, and actually listen to a lot of YouTube rain sounds videos. So maybe it's like a repairing mm. or something to be so removed from the stuff that I'm doing during the day. Yeah, but I have found that during lockdown, those things that I do to normally relax uh, have become less and less effective. We've sort of been... Uh, like trying to do as much of them as possible to the point where I've almost overdosed on them. So, you know, like watch so many cooking videos on YouTube to relax, hurry up and relax almost that they've lost their relaxation effect. Now they're just like yet another thing that's like work that I'm meant to do. So hopefully that writes itself after stage four is over. Yeah. I, I I'm kind of, I've been watching a lot of, um, of Scandi film noir, sort of Scandi noir mm. stuff, and I've just reached the stage where I'm just like, I can't watch any of Scandi noir. I just can't. <laughs> no more, please. So yeah. I've gone back to just watching Grand Designs. Oh, it's so good, show. though. Yeah. Yeah, so good. It's one of the best things to just put on and it's clever and it's not demanding, but it's still dramatic without being threatening. I love it. I love Kevin MacLeod. I, so I also scary. love the fact that there's, I think of all of the shows I've ever watched, there's about three times when they've stayed under budget. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can guarantee that the one thing that will be complete, um, you know, fiction is the budget. Everything else. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. Amazing they even bother to state one at the beginning. I know, the right? It's, it's quite entertaining. My favourite ones are the ones who, who decide to do it without an architect or a designer. Mm. They're just going to do it themselves from their mind. <laughs> Tell us. We're going to do it without an architect or without a project manager. Like, oh, yes. Yeah, that would Carry definitely on. work. That's going to go, go yeah. so well for you. I like the ones where they get divorced in the middle. Oh, gosh. That's, um, that's about the top level of drama that I will tolerate. No, I, ju I just watched one of those. It was it was a cliff top somewhere on the forbidding Scottish coastline. It was just <laughs> like, why do you want to build there? But it, <laughs> it's fascinating though when you when you're trying to understand what makes people do these things. Mm. You have to wonder if you got divorced building the thing on the cliff top, how well you would have been able to withstand living together on a remote cliff top. That seems doomed. Either way. <laughs> I don't know. There's something quite poetic about it, though. So there's a, you know, if, if you were looking for stories to write or inspiration for, you know, different ideas, you know, how do you, how do you come up with your ideas to, to write your novels and your stories, Anna? I have really limited ideas, to be honest. I struggle a lot with ideas. So mostly I just take things from my life and pretend mm -hmm. that they're made up. I, um, yeah, I, the plot and concept side of writing 
almost entirely eludes me. I really love the nature of words, the sounds that they make and the musicality of words and that part of it I love and write a good sentence but trying to put it into a story is very, very difficult for me. Because I had, I had grand illusions or delusions I should say. <laughs> illusions and delusions of thinking that, you know, because I used to love writing when I was a kid, but there's a difference between writing nonsense when you're at school versus writing stuff that people would actually consume and, and enjoy reading. Um, and I, the, the idea of being able to come up with an, a, a plot that goes from a beginning, a middle to an end, I'm, I, I don't have that amount of creativity in my brain. So I have enormous respect for what we do so how do, what's, do you have any advice for any you know, folks out there that might be budding authors around the creative process? Um, the main piece of advice that I always give to writers, and I teach writing, so this is something I say a lot to my students, is really just to keep going. I think the biggest mistake that people make when they're writing is to give up because it's hard, mm-hmm. that writing should be you know, ideally writing should be like just getting up and being creative when it suits you, when inspiration strikes, and then eventually a book will sort of emerge by magic. And actually writing a whole book is very hard work. And there's a lot of times in the in the process of writing a book that it feels too hard to keep going. And I think at least a proportion of writers are just the people who didn't give up on doing it. Uh, So that's a really hard thing to, I think it's a hard thing to accept about writing is that there are times when it isn't fun and you don't feel creatively fulfilled and you don't want to do it anymore. And maybe you even hate it. And all of those things are a normal part of being a writer. So yeah, that part Uh, and linked to that is the fact that there isn't a magic key to writing I think something that I thought about or thought when I was starting out as a writer was that there was like a club behind the scenes that I didn't know how to get into and until I figured that out I couldn't be a writer not realizing that the way to be a writer was to do writing not to look for you know a quick fix or a shortcut or something that would make me a writer faster than writing um, which is something that a surprisingly large number of people also are trying to do it's a ve- that's a very very common way to try to get into writing like oh, I don't <laughs> it seems like nonsense that I should have to write in order to become a writer there must be some other step that I need to take or something I have to do first or some way I can be one without having to actually do it first uh, and then once I'm once I am one then I'll write a book you know, sort of a bit ass backwards. So how, how did you how did you come from being, you know, a digital marketer uh, working on Ramsey Street, mm. you know, many people know, to, to actually being an author? How did you, how did that happen? Uh, well, I've always Life written... was involved, obviously. <laughs> I have always written stories since I was a little kid. My dad has all these stories that I wrote when I was in kindergarten onwards that he kept which is really lovely, but um, I, yeah, I have always wanted to be a writer. I would always have said that when I was at school, that that was what I wanted to do. And then when I was 19, I got pregnant and I had my first daughter when I was 20 and the luxury of writing was not available to me. You know, I had to, I had to make a living. Um, And so the way that I did that was I had always tinkered in, web development as well, just for interest. I just found as a teenager, I just found that interesting. Like how do you, how do you build a website and how do you, what does it do when you change the code here? And um, how do you make a website do this? And how, so I had always done that. So I became a web developer. Um, I did that for quite a few years, mostly as a front end developer, which I hated and it wasn't really, I mean, still a little bit creative, but it was the wrong kind of creative from what I was hoping to do but in each of the jobs that I had there's always some small opportunity to write something so I would often find development into writing 
Yeah, like I would find that but the timing was a really big part of it. So I started to find that um, people, this was, so this was probably 2007 or something and having a regular like newsletter being a really big thing. And so I would get put in charge of doing that because I was the only sort of tech person that there was, or I was the person who was on the, you know, who knew how to do the website. And so I also did the newsletter and in doing that, I had a chance to write and people always said to me, oh, did you write this? I was like, yeah. And they're like, oh, you're really good at this. And I was like, oh, am I? That's something I, oh, maybe I can, you know, maybe I can do a bit of that. Or, And then social media became a thing and that was a logical combination of writing and, and development for me, I think, which was I started out at the Grand Prix. This is the Australian Grand Prix Corporation. Um, started out in sort of a front-end development, uh, project managing the website development kind of role. And while I was there, that we, I, we put together a Facebook page, which was very new then, uh, and grew that audience. And I really loved talking to those people in that channel, like to be able to talk directly to them, to be able to create a digital brand voice for the organisation and for the different races that they put on and uh, to be able to capture the spirit of it. And that was so much more interesting to me than just project managing the website build. And also I was better at it than I was at project managing. Like I was not a very good web developer, but I was a good writer. So it was always a relief to me when I could do something that I thought I was actually good at instead of being just an okay developer when there were so many other, I always felt like saying to people, don't hire me as a developer because there are people out there who are much better at it than I am. And I am not meant to this. This isn't what I strive to do or hope to. And people would ask me, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? And they're like, not websites. <laughs> like, no offense. But I, so yeah. So once I did social media at the Grand Prix, I um, became the social media manager for a bit at Suncorp. And then I was the digital manager, digital and social media manager at, um, Fremantle Media for Neighbours, which was my dream job. That was actually genuinely my bona fide dream job that I had set for myself at least five years before then. I'd grown up watching Neighbours and that was a job I had decided I would love to do, to like write the content for the website, do tweets for the show, all that kind of stuff that that was my job. So when it was advertised, I just nearly died of excitement and then went full bore into this interview just they had they'd been advertising it for six months or something and hadn't found anybody I was like god I really have to impress them um it was very exciting to get that job <laughs> yeah that was a real highlight and off, off, so you you end up working uh yeah on Ramsey Street or with Ramsey Street characters what was what was something that perhaps surprised you about that experience that you you weren't expecting <laughs> Um, probably the nature of the sets more than anything, which was, they're not real places. That was very, I don't know why I thought they would be, but they're not. And, um, being on set in these places that I had seen in their sort of, you know, the illusion of being a fully formed place on TV and then being in them and seeing the behind the scenes of them and how they worked. And that was very, that was a very, very strange experience for me. I found that really disconcerting actually. Um, yeah, there were things that weren't surprising, but that were nice. Like everybody was really nice and everybody worked really hard and there was a lot of creativity there. So I think to answer your original question, part of how I came to be a writer was that I was then surrounded by writers. So instead of being surrounded by like IT support, which is what I had been before, or, you know, like the group marketing manager or the, the, there's a marketing team. I was then right next door to the writer's room. I was surrounded by people whose job was to be creative next to the art department, you know, making friends with the script writers and the script editors and all these people whose whole job was to be creative and often to write things all the time. And that legitimized it for me. I think I felt like I can do, yeah, the, you can be a writer. It's not, you know, some, job. Yeah, like it's not a, it's not just something that I thought as a kid that was fun to do, you know, draw a picture of a bird and write, this is a bird under it and that was a story, but 
to actually there are actually ways of making it your vocation uh, and interesting ways and versatile and varied ways of being a writer that I hadn't ever I had never seen uh, and had no idea about so that was just luck or a lot of this was just luck the timing was lucky the fact that people were nice enough to tell me that they thought I was a good writer was lucky um, you know the fact that this job came up right when I needed it and was looking for it was lucky and so yeah I've been extremely lucky but all of this is sort of stuck a funnel into being a writer, it just became more and more and more a part of the role that I had until it was the only one that I had. I really find it fascinating how how important it was to have, see people who were doing the thing that you're doing because a lot of women talk about that, you know, seeing people like themselves doing stuff, you know, leadership roles and stuff. For you, it was seeing people being writers to realise it was a legitimate thing that you could aspire to. That, that it just shows you how important it is in so many different contexts to have people doing things, to see people doing things. And maybe I'm not very brave. <laughs> I needed some evidence that I, I could make it work. Um, also, my children were older. And so there was a point at which I thought, okay, it's time for me to do something that I like now, which coincided with that time. Just okay, all of these things have sort of come together now. Um, take a few signs from the universe, give it a try. I, you know, I left my job at Neighbours and I didn't have a job to go to and I thought I'm going to try to be a writer and I've now been a writer for seven years full time. So. And you call yourself a writer now? Yeah, do you know, I do. And that's what my job is. Yeah, it took a long time for me to feel like that was a legitimate label that I could give myself. And there's a lot of, you know, people put a lot of kind of almost responsibility on this word writer and wonder when they're allowed to use it. And, that, you know, am I a real writer? Am I, um, can I call myself a writer? Like there's some rule around when you're allowed to use it. And, um, but once I, <laughs> once I realised that people were paying me to write and it was my only source of income, it's like, well, what other word is there for it? That's what my job is. And so, yeah, I mean, now when I say it to people, you know, I meet people and they go, what do you do? And oh, I'm a writer. And they go, oh, yeah, what sort of writer? I'm like, oh, oh. And then it takes me by surprise a little bit because it is just my job, like any other kind of label is a job. Um, but I often get challenged by people for calling myself a writer. What kind of writer are you? Like, oh, I write all kinds of things. They're like, mm, a very good writer. Have you had have you, have you had anything published? I'm like, well, yeah, actually, I've had two books published, and I've got another book coming out next year, and I've written for all these, and I've, and I'm a, like the nonfiction editor of a magazine, and and they're like, oh, 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 you, oh, you are a writer. I'm like, yeah, that's what I said. And for them, it's you know, it's <laughs> saying that you're a writer is like, I think what they think it is is you're saying like I'm noteworthy and important, that that's what writer means to them, not just when I write words down and send them to my client, they pay my invoice, which is really, you know, being a working writer is rarely just writing books and publishing them. Um, there's only a select group of people who can do that. So being a working writer is writing books, teaching, writing, mentoring, coaching, um, you know, doing corporate copywriting, like the podcast, doing script writing, all kinds of things. It's all sorts of different sorts of writing and it's not all fun and it's not all glamorous. Um, and in a lot of ways, I have realised it is just, yeah, just a vocation, one that I really like and luckily I'm quite skillful at. But, um, yeah, the sort of mystique of the writer quickly dissipates <laughs> once you become one like oh my god I've been wearing these clothes for three days and my children are screaming and I have a deadline and I just can't it, yeah it it's not so on the deadline yeah. that was mm. one I wanted to ask uh -oh. yes I, I follow a lot of so one of my favorite people if I could recommend anybody to read anybody's books it would be Caitlin Moran she's one of my yeah. favorite authors and she's the way she writes is pithy, it's funny, it's authentic. Yeah. It's really irreverent, but really masterful at the same time. 
and she talks quite bluntly sometimes about the the looming kind of ticking clock of a deadline and sometimes how that sort of completely takes over from the creative process because you just sat there looking at the deadline rather than <laughs> the mm. thing that you're trying to write. So do deadlines do the same thing to you? How do you deal with them? How do you, how do you navigate through that kind of impending doom of <laughs> the deadline hitting and you've got to send your copy? So I think writing is sort of a series of impending dooms for a start. So <laughs> at one level, you you just become acclimatised to constant imp- impending doom. Uh, I find I'm a very disorganised person, so deadlines help me. And if I don't have one, I don't write. So I find them very useful, extremely threatening, and I always think I'm not going to meet them. And I almost always do. And so there's this constant push pull of like, oh my God, this is fucked. I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. I'm just going to tell them I can't. I'm going to lie. I'm going to tell them I'm sick. And then another voice. It's like, if you you know, if you just get on with it, you will get it done. Why don't you just get on with it? You're like, but what if I just snap instead? Like just try writing, you know, just an outline, do an outline and then see how you feel. And I think eventually what you get is a snowball effect of writing, which is, all right, I sort of know what I'm going to say. Why don't I try writing something, a, a bit of an intro? And like, oh, okay, yeah, no, I can see where this goes. And eventually it comes together, but it's always a fight every single time. Mm. So do you think with with no deadline whatsoever, you would not be able to do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I often think about this because, a, a, I mean, a phenomenon of authors, people who write books, is that the first book you write, you have as much time as you need. You know, you just write it and write it and write it and write it until you're ready to send it to somebody who might publish it. And then usually what happens is after it's published, you have to write another one and people want you to write it pretty quickly, you know, more or less immediately. And so where you previously maybe you had 10 years to try to get it right, you have one year to try to get it right. And it's a totally different thing. Um, And so all of the all of the procrastination, all of the perfectionism and everything that you had at your disposal to do the first one is just gone. Um, And I think for some people that doesn't work. For me, I found that it really helped me. I wrote my first book over three years and I wrote my second book in three months. Oh, wow. So it was a very, and I didn't, I, I haven't finished writing any more books since then yet. I've written a lot of three quarters of books. But uh, the nature of, you know, there's an expectation that you will do this now, you're contracted to do it, get it done, do it properly, is quite freeing for me in an odd way. All right, this is, I know what I have to focus on, it's this, so I'm going to do it. Whereas otherwise I'm just like, oh, I might just do whatever I like and not do it, like just, ah. Oh. And that's how that's how my writing process is without a deadline. Yeah, I need deadlines to get anything done, especially I, I like externally imposed deadlines because I can <laughs> always negotiate with myself. That's right. Yeah. I'm such a loose negotiator. I'm like, oh, can I have an extra day? I'm like, have 10. It's fine. <laughs> Don't even worry about it. Yeah, yeah. So another thing I noticed was that, that um, you're doing some studies too, I gather. Mm. In theory. Yeah, I'm a PhD candidate at Deakin. Um, I'm near, actually, in fairness to myself, nearly finished. Um, but yeah, I'm doing, I'm writing about the nature of the combination of borderline personality disorder, memory, and time, temporal memory, kind of. It's, um, it's very interesting. Do you find that that during this strange time of pandemic that time is, you're perceiving time differently? Sometimes, yeah. The the purpose of time is different. What's a day for? Like, I don't, I don't know. When does it start and end? I sort of get up whenever I feel like it and go to bed whenever I feel like it. And in the middle I do the stuff I have to do, but it's very stretchy, you know. Um, the slowness of 
not having your day broken up by the usual things, I think is definitely part of it. So where you normally would go out for lunch or at least go to get lunch at work, or you would, um, you know, talk to a friend in the office and have a break from your work or whatever you would normally do in a day, none of that is there. So what are the markers and the signposts for time passing? You know, the indicators that time is going along just not there anymore. And I will eventually just be like, ah, oh, I think I'm tired and lie down. But it's not, you know, there's no external sort of, it's time now. You have to get I up. My, I think my experience is a bit different to yours because I've got, I just have like eight hours a day of, of Teams meetings <laughs> with no breaks. Oh, yeah, no. So, so time is weirdly compressed but mm. sort of elongated at the same time. So weeks pass really quickly, days pass in a blur, but then trying to remember like the start of the pandemic, it just seems like forever ago. Mm. Yeah, that it really does. Ago. It seems it could have been any time. You could tell me that that was four years ago and I'd be like, yeah, that seems right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, really... it's just lost all of its definition. It's all just blurry and, and squeezy and stretchy. Yeah. So, no, quite strange, yeah. Oh, this 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 is an unprecedented time. I mean, people say unprecedented <laughs> time. But no one's ever said unprecedented so often as they have this year. But I think it's going to change the way we work for I hope everybody. So. Um, you know, I normally have a two-hour each way commute. Mm. I'm loving it, but I'm conscious that not everybody is having a good time. So mm. I'm always careful when I say that in mixed company because you don't know who's having a struggle at the moment. Mm. And it's such an, um, it's such a behind closed doors struggle in a lot of ways too, isn't it? Where it's not, it's harder to notice how other people are traveling. Maybe. I actually think I completely agree with that point. I think because we're all in our own little, genuinely in our own little bubble. Mm. Um, it's so hard to recognize to, to look for signs from somebody that you work mm. with, that you care about every day, because you don't see them every day anymore. You don't see them the, in the in-between moments. Mm. You don't see them for the moments that you're on a, you know, a video call or that you do actually have a chance to catch up for a socially distanced coffee or cup of tea. Mm. You know, it, it's, it's hard to, without mm. seeing the, the rest of the context of their life. Um, so I'm, I'm finding it sort of, it's really important to do the check-ins to... Oh, um, yeah. But the thing I've noticed is... Four or five days, you okay? We don't mm. even see their whole body. Like in the office, you can mm. see from head to toe. But now you just see this much. So you can't, like, see, you know, is somebody losing weight? Wearing money? pants. Are they, uh, you know... Are so they you wearing know, pants? You see, okay, wearing pants. Yeah. I am wearing pants. But, but you know, so, so you can't see the whole person mm. anymore. Yeah, you get a version of them. Yeah. Mm. And I find this whole thing of my face on the screen while I'm talking to people really alienating because I'm not used to looking at my face while I talk to people during the day and it's quite mm. how crap I look half the time. <laughs> no, you're lovely. It's just, it's just really confronting, you know, and I've got one team member who's stuck in India. He's stuck in the remotest part of India and they keep having these cyclones oh, and wow. I can... And I keep having my catch-ups with him and I can't hear him. It's just really, really weird. Yeah, a lot of those bits are. I gave a, um, a presentation to a class of about 30 uni students, I think, and the conditions of the uni was that they all had their cameras off while, while anybody was presenting. So it was really just talking to my screen with no indication from any of them as to whether they were interested or they were even still alive or it was just blank screens staring back at me. And I was like, oh, God, there's really nothing, no energy to pick up on, no kind of, you know, nothing, nothing to help you along. <laughs> it was really and intimidating. Is this, is this just the new future that we have to face? What, speaking into the void? <laughs> If you're teaching, that, that's pretty much your future because we're not going to get people back on campus full-time for a couple of years, I suspect. 
Yeah, I've always been an online only teacher. So my my students had more or less the same experience that they had already been planning to have besides all of the other factors in the rest of their lives. Um, but the students who were moving then from on campus to off campus, that was a total just shitstorm of terrified people having no idea what they were meant to be doing. So it's very, it's a very different experience for me. It's normal, but it, yeah, I mean, all of the ways that you would normally communicate with somebody have to be adjusted. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, you have to find other ways of connecting with somebody at a less superficial level, which is not easy. You know, it takes, it takes a lot of attention. It, you have to really concentrate to connect with somebody at that level without having the usual physical sort of modes, I guess. Hmm. But maybe being on social media for so many years helps me do that because it's been, it's been my job like 10 years to find oh, really? ways to connect with people on the internet. Maybe. I think so. Yeah. so. People who've been on social media are adjusting much better than the rest of us. I think so. <laughs> like all my friends were in the computer already. So <laughs> I don't know what the problem is. Yeah. So that probably a pretty good place for us to call it to an end. Thank you so much, Anna. It's been really oh, interesting. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Annie. And thanks, everybody. Please don't forget to give us a positive review because that would be nice. And we'll be back shortly. Thanks. Thank you.